We're used to music and films sounding big and realistic, that's thanks to stereo sound. Two channels, left and right, create a sense of space, immersing us in what is happening. But has sound always been stereophonic? How did stereo come about? And has it changed over time, or has the format remained the same since its invention? This video will trace the evolution of the stereo format, from its inception to the present day. The first steps of sound recording and playback were related exclusively to monophonic sound. In the late 19th and early 20th century, when Thomas Edison and other inventors created phonographs and gramophones, all recording was done in one channel. Simply put, sound was recorded and played back through a single speaker or acoustic tube. For listeners of the time, this was a miracle, live music or voice preserved on a record or cylinder. However, such sound did not convey the dimensionality to which one was accustomed in real life. Our hearing is designed in stereo. Two ears allow us to determine where the sound is coming from. And even then, engineers wondered whether it was possible to force the sound to move, to make it more natural. Back in 1881, an unusual experiment was conducted in France. Visitors to an exhibition were given a telephone tube to each ear, broadcasting an opera performance through two separate audio channels. The listeners had the startling illusion of being in the theatre, in fact, it was the first primitive experience of stereo sound, sound was then transmitted only by wire, in real time, not from a recording. That early demonstration showed that separate sound reproduction for each ear could greatly enhance the sense of presence. The full birth of stereophonic sound as a recorded and reproduced format is due to inventions in the early 1930s. In 1931, a British engineer, Alan Blumline, patented a system of binaural sound. Legend has it that the idea came to him in a cinema. Watching an actor move across the screen, Blumline noticed that the sound remained attached to one loudspeaker. So he thought, why not make the sound follow the image? This is how the concept of stereo recording came about, to record sound on two channels and, on playback, to feed it separately to the left and right speakers, creating the illusion of sound moving in space. Bloomline developed several key technologies for stereo. He proposed a method of recording two channels of sound on one track and designed a special microphone for stereo recording, Bloomline Stereo Pair, two microphones crossed at an angle. In 1933, Amy Studios conducted one of the first stereophonic experiments. They recorded a short film with two-channel sound. The audience at the test screening was amazed. The train passing in the film moved from one edge of the screen to the other not only in image but also in sound. This was probably the first time that the audience felt the effect of real stereo. However, in those years stereo sound remained only a laboratory experiment. Recording technologies on film and gramophone records had serious limitations. In addition, the Second World War broke out, and stereo development was put on the back burner. After the war, interest in stereo sound was revived with renewed energy. By the early 1950s, there were sophisticated tape recorders that could record sound on two separate tracks. Sound engineers experimented with stereo recording of concerts and orchestras on magnetic tape. However, the general public could not play such tapes, home tape recorders remained exotic. What was needed was a mass medium for stereo. The solution came in the form of the familiar vinyl record, or rather, its improved version. Ordinary gramophonic records of that time were monophonic, the needle read the vibrations of the groove deflecting sideways, left-right, and thus one channel was recorded. So how to fit two channels of sound in one narrow groove without changing the format of the record? Engineers came up with an elegant solution, make the needle move not only left to right, but also up down. In 1957, stereophonic recording technology was introduced with the so-called 45-45 system. Simply put, the sides of the soundtrack in a record were made to tilt at a 45 degrees angle, each side began to carry its own channel of sound. The combination of horizontal and vertical vibrations made it possible to encode two separate audio signals, left and right, in the same groove. At the same time, 
the record diameter, speed of rotation and other parameters remained the same as in mono. In 1958, the first stereophonic records went on sale. This was an event for music lovers. Now you could hear the sound at home, distributed across the channels, almost like in a concert hall. An orchestra on a record sounded wider, a jazz ensemble sounded more realistic, the panorama of instruments and the acoustics of the hall were conveyed much better than in mono. Of course, special equipment was required for reproduction of the novelty. Stereophonic turntables and stereo cartridges appeared, record players capable of reading the complex movement of the needle in two planes. The question arises, could the old monophonic turntables play such records? Theoretically, the mono needle would extract only part of the record from the stereo channel, only the horizontal oscillations, that is, the total mono signal. But practically, a heavy mono cartridge with a stiff needle could damage the delicate stereo canal because it had subtle vertical modulations. So the new stereo records required modern lightweight pickups. Stereo needles were made thinner and more flexible, they precisely tracked all the curves of the groove without scratching it. At the same time, stereo players could play old mono records without any problems. The signal from both slanted sides was simply combined into one, giving the usual mono. By the end of the 50s, stereo was firmly rooted in the homes of music lovers thanks to vinyl. It was a revolution in recording. Many recordings made years earlier to spare were released in stereo for the first time. The studios had anticipated the new format and wrote some albums in advance on two channels. These archival stereo recordings amazed listeners with their volume and new sound details. In the 1960s, stereo sound began to rapidly take over the world. If at first stereo equipment was an expensive pleasure for audiophiles, it gradually became cheaper and affordable for mass consumers. In 1961, the first regular FM broadcasts in stereo began in the USA. Music on the air sounded simultaneously from two channels. FM radio format allowed to transmit stereo signal without serious interference, and by the middle of the decade stereo stations appeared in many countries. Car drivers were able to listen to music in stereo in their cars, not only at home. In the recording industry, Stereo soon became the new standard. Famous rock and pop albums of the 1960s were released in two versions, mono and stereo, until the demand for mono finally waned. By the end of the 1960s it was clear that stereo was not a temporary fad, but the future of music. Young people of that time wanted to listen to modern songs in stereo to fully immerse themselves in the sound. Electronics shops offered compact stereo systems for the home, with two speakers, an amplifier and a turntable. It was preferred to listen to records through a pair of separated speakers to get the right stereo image. Two channels of sound became mainstream and part of everyday life. Having achieved success with stereo, the recording industry didn't stop. In the early 1970s, enthusiasts decided that if two channels made the music experience so much better, what would happen if they added more? Thus was born the idea of quadrophony, a system with four channels. The idea was to place four speakers in the corners of the room so that the listener would be in the center of the sound square. The first recordings and equipment for Quadro sound were even released on the market. Engineers came up with several ways to accommodate four audio channels on the usual media, vinyl records and magnetic tapes. However, Quadro sound did not gain mass acceptance. The equipment was too complex and expensive, there were several incompatible formats, and for most listeners the improvement was not dramatic enough to justify the effort. By the late 1970s, the attempt to introduce the Quadro format had effectively died out. Still, this episode is significant, it demonstrates the industry's desire to expand the sonic space. Some audiophiles look back on those experiments with nostalgia, and rare quad records are now collector's items. At the same time in the 1970s, stereo continued to improve and enter all areas of audio. Better quality reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders and compact cassettes capable of recording and playing music in stereo appeared. 
The emergence of portable players was particularly noteworthy. In 1979, Sony released the legendary Walkman, a cassette player with headphones. Its peculiarity was that it gave high-quality stereo sound directly to the listener's ears and was small enough to carry with the listener. Millions of people for the first time had the opportunity to take music on the go, listening to their favorite songs in stereo headphones anywhere, on the street, in transport, in the park. Portable stereo became part of everyday life. Many people remember how in the 80s, wearing headphones, they immersed themselves in music as if they were inside it. It was the stereo effect that gave this feeling of personal sound space. The late 1970s and early 1980s marked the transition of audio to the digital realm. In 1982, the compact disc appeared, a new medium that promised incredible sound quality without noise or wear and tear. The CD format from the beginning was designed for two channels, stereo, 16-bit digital sound at 44.1 kHz. It continued the stereo tradition at a new technological level. In the mid-1980s, music on CD began to replace vinyl massively, and music lovers appreciated the purity and accuracy of stereo sound in digital. No crackle, wide dynamic range, channels separated perfectly. Stereo did not disappear with the arrival of digital. On the contrary, it sounded even better. In the 1980s and 90s, other areas of audio were also improved. Stereo sound systems for television appeared, and home video recorders began to record films with hi-fi stereo sound. Films on VHS with stereo support allowed us to enjoy cinema-like surround sound at home, although it was still the same two channels. In the 1990s, along with the rise of stereo, a new wave of multi-channel sound was emerging, primarily for cinema. Dolby Surround and then Dolby Digital 5.1 brought full surround sound to home cinemas. But stereo still reigned in music. In the early 2000s, attempts were made to release music albums in 5.1 format, for example, on Super Audio CD or DVD audio discs, recordings with six channels were released. However, it never became mass. The vast majority of people continued to listen to music using the classic two-channel format. Apparently, the conservatism of music lovers and simple practice had an effect. Almost everyone had a stereo system or headphones, but few people were ready to equip a room with a lot of speakers. The late 90s and 2000s brought us the internet and compressed digital audio. The MP3 format, which appeared in the late 1990s, and other encoding methods greatly simplified the distribution of music. They retained full stereo sound, of course, music was distributed digitally, but still in two channels. People around the world continued to listen to songs through stereo computer speakers and to share audio files. Stereo proved remarkably survivable and versatile. It survived the change of media, from vinyl and tape to optical disc and then to files, virtually unchanged. Nowadays, it is reasonable to ask, has the stereo system itself changed since its introduction? In fact, no, the basic principle has remained the same. Two separate channels of sound corresponding to our binaural, two-ear, hearing. However, the technical possibilities have grown many times over. Modern audio standards support very high-quality stereo recordings, up to high-definition formats, which increases detail and dynamic range. This does not invalidate the two-channel principle, but makes stereo sound even clearer and more accurate. In recent years, there has been an increased interest in going beyond the classic two channels. Virtualization technologies make it possible, even in ordinary headphones, to create the illusion of space around the listener, so-called binaural sound. The technique, by the way, is not new. There are special recordings made with a dummy head, a mannequin with microphones in the ears, which when listened to through headphones give a strikingly realistic three-dimensional scene. However, such experiments remain a niche for enthusiasts. At the same time, with the development of cinema surround sound systems, the music industry also began to try multi-channel formats. Dolby Atmos Music, for example, appeared, 
an approach in which tracks are mixed not in two channels, but in a special format with virtual placement of sounds in space. When playing such recordings on a compatible system, it feels like the sounds are flying around the listener in three dimensions. Some streaming services offer versions of songs in spatial audio format. It seems that a new era is ahead, where stereo may give way to even more immersive technologies. But it's too early to write off classic stereo. The vast majority of listeners still enjoy music in stereo, whether it's vinyl, CD, or digital streaming. Two channels of sound remain the most versatile and familiar way to hear a song. From monophonic phonographs and bold engineering experiments to the vinyl revolution, through the era of cassettes, compact discs, and streaming, the stereo format has retained its essence. The two channels, left and right, still create the magic of presence. Stereo has survived more than one generation of devices and media, and looks set to stay with us for a long time to come.